Um, on a human level, I saw a very decent person in evident pain, in grief, obviously deep anxiety about the fate of her father. I saw somebody trying to make the best out of a really horrific situation, and my heart goes out to her. You need some historical context. Now, look, I used to be a Zionist, I'm a, and I'm a Holocaust survivor. Zionism was very important for me as a salvation of the Jewish people, until I found out that the state was founded based on the extirpation, the expulsion, and multiple massacres of the local population. And that's not historically controversial. So I'm taking a longer view of this. And I'm saying that the present situation cannot be understood without looking at the historical context. And nor can we move forward if the present occupation and the suppression of the Palestinians continue. So Sharon, your previous guest, talked about the fragile coexistence. There was no coexistence. There was oppression periodic massacres, land occupation in the West Bank, the continuous expulsion of the population from their homes. I visited the occupied territories three times now. The first time, back during the first intifada, peers, I cried every day for two weeks at what I saw. So this cannot go on. And I saw the news about the Elgin marbles being returned, and how you changed your mind about that. Well, how about returning the land that's been stolen from the Palestinians? I'm not talking about the state of Israel. I'm not talking about 1948. I'm talking about since 67 and what's going on right now. So there's got to be some stop to what's going on, and that's yeah. how I understand it. This I, is for the I, sake of both Israelis and Palestinians. Oh, I, look, I live in Canada, where this country was founded on the suppression and the erasure of the indigenous population and the utter denial of their narrative. And uh, in Canada, for example, there were horrendous residential schools where a few decades ago, if a native child spoke their tribal language, they'd have a pin stuck in their tongue. Most Canadians are not aware of that history. Most Israelis are not aware of the history of what the Palestinians have suffered. They don't know that in 1948, there were multiple massacres of large numbers of people by Israeli forces. They don't know the history, the subjective experience of the Palestinians. And in the absence of that knowledge, October 7th would just strike them as another horrific anti-Semitic event. I understand the desire for defense and certainly even a desire for revenge, but that's in the absence of knowing what the Palestinian experience has been. And the Western press, and as in all countries where the local population has been displaced, the majority of the population doesn't know the history or the subjective experience. So if you're asking me how to move forward, let's inform ourselves of the actual experience of both sides, not just one side. Yes, Israel has the right to defend itself. Every country does. But Israel has no right to impose an occupation on people. Now look, I was born in Hungary. In 1956, when I was 13, studying for Bar Mitzvah, there was the Great Hungarian Revolution against Soviet occupation. And uh, it was after that revolution that we became refugees and came to Canada. Now, did Russia have the right to defend itself against the Hungarian revolutionaries? You know, so, the, and, and mostly when we talk about Israel's right of defense, we're taking isolated Palestinian actions, but we're not saying that this population also has the right to defend against the, against the occupation. I'm not justifying the, the terrible events of October the 7th. I'm talking in the absence of historical awareness. It all just looks like Israel defending itself. But against whom? Against the population that has been massacring in a number of thousands for 80 years and taking their lands and destroying their homes and jailing their children and torturing them. That's the history. Now, unless we know that, it all looks like this poor little country trying to defend itself. But against whom? Against people that's been occupying and displacing for 80 years. That's the history. As Israeli historians have shown, I don't make this stuff up. I wish it wasn't true. I wish I could believe in the dream of the Jewish state. I love that dream, except I found out at what price, at what nightmare that imposed on the Palestinians. Look, you're going to have Nick Kriya who's on later on, the tennis player. I just spent a couple of weeks in Serbia um, and the former Yugoslavia with another tennis player, Novak Djokovic. They have a foundation that promotes uh, healing and child development and so on. So they asked me to speak throughout the former Yugoslavia. You know what horrific atrocities were committed there just a few decades ago. So I was in Belgrade. I was in Sarajevo. I was in Banja Luka. I was in Ljubljana. They're living together now. There are still issues to be worked 
worked out. But the minimum condition is the ending of the occupation and the inhumane siege of Gaza. And international law has to be respected. International law is very clear that this occupation is illegal. That has to be the basis of any future agreement. If that was agreed on, and if Israel could live within the borders that are internationally recognized, I believe peace is possible. Now, we keep talking about the Hamas Charter. Did you know that the Likud Charter, the ruling part in Israel, excludes the Palestinian entity west of the Jordan River? But let's get rid of both charters, and let's start with the basis of recognition and peace and the ending of this unspeakably brutal occupation of the national community, and particularly Israel's big brothers, the UK and the US, stop supporting its illegal, brutal, inhumane, and rapacious occupation. It can't happen without some pressure. Um, and again, most Israelis are simply not aware. I've been to Israel, talked to people. They have no idea what's happening a few miles away from when they're sitting in Tel Aviv having coffee. And they have no idea. Or in Jerusalem. And they have no idea what's happening a few miles away, how those people under occupation are living. And this has been... Dog it's not that they're not capable of being aware, but like most people, they just not. And I'm saying that unless we fully get the Palestinian experience historically and throughout the decades and into the present moment, we can't possibly understand what's going on here. Now, in 2005, there was a, a study appeared in the Journal of World Psychiatry looking at traumatized populations under war conditions. The most traumatized children in 2005, this is before Hamas gained power in, uh, in Palestine and in Gaza, the most traumatized kids were in Gaza. This population has been traumatized traumatized severely. Of course they're full of rage. I'm not justifying anything they did, but I'm saying what do we expect from this population that's been suppressed and tormented and crucified for decades? In 1967, I wrote an article after the war arguing by that time that Israel had occupied these territories quite deliberately and then never give them back. My father kicked me out of the house. I accepted that. Now my father later on came around and actually agreed with me. But I made the decision that to be myself and to speak my truth, I'm willing to break the contact if that's what it took. 